Amen. God's grace is amazing, and it is, and we know that. Well, let's see. We have, I want Verna, I don't usually do this in the middle of the service, but we shook hands. Verna, would you introduce uh, your guest there? Guests? <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Thank you for coming. And they live in the house right across from you. Right? I had a new house as well in this development here. And, uh, good to have you here. And uh, yeah, her husband's away right now, military in Saudi Arabia, I think you said, right? Wow. What's his name? James. We'll be praying for James. What branch of the military is he in? The Navy. Brother John. He's a Navy man. Brother John right behind you there was a, was a <laughs> Navy veteran. Well, amen. Uh, good to have you. Judy's in the back again. She's been visiting with us. Make sure you say hi to her. Good to have you here, Judy. And good to see you. She's, she travels quite a ways. All right, you guys live right over here. You can walk here, right? Just even, Vernon, that's nice. We could even walk. I like Terry. A lot of times used to walk through the, through the park there the, uh, by the, the uh, gardens in the Wahiwa Botanical. There's a, there's a bridge that sort of goes through the gulch there. And uh, it's not that far, but Judy now. Is it Hawaii Kai? Down that way? Further? <laughs> well, it's quite a ways. But we're glad you're here. Thank you for coming and making the trip. Um, as you know, we said earlier, we're going to be going out to Haleiwa for a baptism today after the dinner that we have. And we want you to stay if you can. Stay for dinner, um, both of you and all of you. Uh, is there a new visitor in the back there? Is that someone that's, that's been here before? All right, okay. You look familiar, but uh, when people tell me that, well, you look familiar, I say, was it me? I didn't do it. I, was it me? <laughs> but uh, you look <laughs> familiar. Well, great. Well, we're in First Peter today. We're working through this book, this letter. Uh, Peter, of course, the author, we know God's Word is the Holy Spirit, inspired God's Word and used human writers like Peter, like Paul, James, the Gospel records, the life of Christ. But Peter was writing, remember, to the saints scattered throughout the Roman Empire. He mentions it in chapter 1, verse 1, because they were being persecuted for their faith in Christ. They were trusting Christ. They were preaching the Gospel as he commanded. We're all commanded to do that. Amen. And uh, were losing jobs and had to move away, and they were being threatened, their lives so he's writing to encourage them. Uh, he says in verse 6 of chapter 1, greatly rejoice. And he's probably saying to these people that are suffering, rejoice. And you're thinking, why would they do that when they're suffering? He says, wherein you greatly rejoice, verse 6, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. And he knows they're going through it, but he wants to encourage them. He doesn't want to make them further discouraged. You know, it's like the guy who was going to commit suicide and jump off the bridge, and somebody came up there and talked to him. By the time the guy that was depressed talked to the other guy that tried to help him, they both jumped off the bridge, right? So you don't want to, you don't want to do that. And so you want to encourage. And, and, you know, the church really is a place who should receive encouragement from each other, from the pastor, yes, through the preaching of God's Word, as God speaks to your heart, the Holy Spirit, if you're saved, living in you, will will speak to you in a way, uh, again, uh, not an audible voice, but God's Word through His Holy Spirit encourages you in the Word to understand it better, to, again, apply it to your hearts, and to be doers of the Word, just basic, simple obedience to the Word of God. We're going to see some words here today. This is the second section. We're starting chapter 2 today in the first three verses. How to live your life through suffering. And uh, again, you, you may say, Pastor, you don't know what I'm going through. And I might not. Everybody goes through different things, different parts of your life, stages of your life, kids, grandkids, no kids, single, divorced. I mean, all kinds of things. We understand that. And he says to them here in the first three verses, to help to live through suffering, to give your life to God. Two things today, two points only, Francis. Lay aside, <laughs> lay aside things. We're going to have, there's a list here of things to lay aside, all right? And uh, we're going to look at each one and, and in a little bit of a detail. And the second thing is to crave, <laughs> to crave the Word of God. He says here, as newborn babes, desire. That word desire means to crave. And we'll see what we're to crave. 
but we're going to look at laying aside. And it gets very forceful. Again, think of who he's writing to, and he's trying to encourage these people. And he uses very descriptive words, and they, this command, it's called an imperative. In other words, he's not saying maybe, kind of like the Ten Commandments, you know. They're not the Ten Suggestions, we say, right? They're, they're imperatives. This is what you must do. And he's saying here to help these people and to help us today. The imperative of laying aside. Look at verse 1 of chapter 2 again. Wherefore, when there's a wherefore, it's there, we say, for a reason, right? Because of what was before it. And he mentioned in uh, the last uh, several verses, the last message when we were here, he talked about having a love for, for believers, remember? And so he says, because of this great love, remember, that you are to lay aside, he says, and there's these words, now we're going to look into each one, lay aside malice and guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speaking, all right? Lay aside. Uh, We're going to look at these things. Laying aside, these words laying aside means to put, it's like taking off after a hard day's work. You go home, you're going to go into your relaxing clothes. I don't know about you, I have different sets of clothes. We have the sleeping clothes, the relaxing clothes, right? The beach clothes and church clothes. So I know when I go home after church, I'm ready to lay aside my church clothes and get into the relax, watch the Giants lose another game mode, whatever. Anyway, it means to strip off, to cast off, uh, of, of, of putting off your clothes as if to cleanse yourself because of things on your clothes that make you dirty. I know preaching is not dirty. It's in the sense I'm doing dirty work, but I get very hot. I get warm. Uh, I know it's cool today. I enjoy the change in the weather here in Hawaii from now, and I guess, till April, May, and then it gets uh, more warm and more humid. And so I like when it's not as humid. I, I enjoy the breeze at night, sleeping, right, Steve? It's nice and cool here in Wahiwa. <laughs> And we have to put like a quilt, believe it or not. When I first came here and Terry said, I said, we need air conditioning in this house. He goes, we don't have heat and we don't have air conditioning. I'm like, what? (laughs) We're in Wahiwa. It's higher up. It's cooler. And sure enough, you know, even if it's a hot day in the middle of the evening, it's like like it drops 8 to 10 degrees. We have a ceiling fan and it gets even a little chilly. Even in August, we got to put a little blanket on. But now we put a blanket and a quilt uh, some mornings we get up, my mom is staying with us. She's a little skinnier than me, as you can see, <laughs> just a little bit. And we put the oven on. I'm making eggs and coffee, and, and she's like, oh, I'm freezing. So I'll put the oven on. Probably shouldn't do it. There's nothing in it, but just to let some warm air. So she'll open the oven door, and she'll go, oh, oh, it feels so good, you know. And so this word laying aside is like someone taking off their clothes because the things uh, that putting off things and getting rid of things that will not only are dirty, but that defile, the word defilement. A commentator I love to read, A.T. Robertson, says there's some things that defile the believer and that could cause problems in your life. And he's telling these people, we're going to look at all these words, malice, guile, hypocrisy, but he means get rid of them, uh, cast them off, strip them off of you, just like you take off clothes and toss them in the hamper for washing. You're to cleanse yourself From these things we're going to look at that can defile and cause problems in your life. Five things here. And all five has to do with what has been said again back in chapter 1. Remember, chapter 2 begins with wherefore. He says in chapter 1, last week's message, love one another with a a pure heart fervently. And the things we are to strip off, we're going to mention in a moment here, that will dirty and soil our love for others. In other words, these five things we're going to look at will affect what he said to do in chapter 1 about this love, this pure and fervent love. And so this has to do with how you treat one another. These people are going through trials, and they must not change that they're going to be so much stress and anxiety that they're going to be so uh, under pressure, it's going to affect how they treat other people. And you know, that's, that's true. <laughs> If you're getting ready for church on a Sunday morning, it it always seems like when you're going to a place or a church or an event, like a wedding or a graduation, everything seems to go wrong on that day. You know, you have to be on time. Your hair doesn't come right, ladies. Your makeup just ain't going on right, you know. 
it's hot, you're sweating, your makeup is running. Men, you know, you put your clothes on, you notice you just put your, something on backwards or your, your trousers weren't ironed. I know about you, know, I like to have a nice crease, you know, and iron my shirt. I have to. <laughs> For whatever reason, you get up and the, the iron breaks, you know, and you're ready to iron and the water starts squirting all over your nice white shirt with rust spots and something's like that happen. <laughs> and you're not to get stressed out. What you have to do, in other words, is look at these five things we're going to look at. And some of you may say, I have no problem with these things. And some of us may say, I have a problem with all five. <laughs> well, hopefully this will help you. All right? And it has to do with how you treat one another when you're, again, under the stresses and the trials of life. First thing, you must strip off or lay aside what he says, like dirty clothes, is malice. All right? See that word malice? You've heard somebody being malicious, right? It could mean two things, two, two kind of definitions here. It could be a general sense. It means all kinds of evil lumped into that one word, all right? Uh, such evil things, and I'm going to quote Romans chapter 1, verse 29 through 32. These are all included and could be included under malice if it's a general sense. You'll see what I mean in a moment when I get into the specific sense. Romans 1.29 begins with being filled with all unrighteousness, a fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, there's malice, but full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, my favorite one, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, and listen to this, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things, that list, they're worthy of death, not only do them do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. That, that's a, a definition in the general sense of the first word mentioned here in chapter 2, verse 1, of malice. General sense, and again, hopefully we're not in that list, none of us here. The narrow sense, the word malice, is a deep-seated feeling of hate, we're supposed to love, right? This is the opposite. Malice means you deeply hate someone. It's a hatred that lasts. It's not like I'm mad for five minutes and now I'm over. No, this is a hatred that lasts. I don't know how it is here in Hawaii, but my family, being Italian-American, when they got mad at somebody, it wasn't a five-minute shouting match. It was like, we're not going to see you for a couple of years. I'm serious. Uh, my grandma, Cuzo, got mad at her sister, my Aunt Angie, they had a fight over something. Who knows what remembers what it was, but I know they had a disagreement. And they didn't talk for five years. Five years. Sisters now. They were close. They worked together. They grew up together. Everything they did together. Children, parties. Saw them often. Talked on the phone every day. Because of an argument, didn't talk for five years. You say, how could that be? Malice. <laughs> it's a terrible sin. It's a terrible kind of a hatred. My Aunt Angie got cancer. My grandmother, and again, she's not with us, neither is my Aunt Angie, did not go to see her sister before she died. Would not go to the funeral service. You've got to be pretty mad. It's got to be pretty deep and pretty bad not to do that. It's terrible, all right? This is a malice, is a hatred that's intense, long-lasting, ill will, actually wishing that something bad would happen to that person that you have malice against. It means to be vicious, spiteful, hold a grudge. It means that a person has turned their heart over to this evil of malice. When I was reading all this about this word, I didn't realize how bad it was. There's no more good feeling toward that person, none whatsoever, and that person could care less if something bad, even to the point of death. I can just give you the example. The charge here to, to these believers is very strong by Peter. Cast it off. Rip it off. Get rid of it. All, right? All the evil and the wicked and the hateful feelings you have for others. Believers are to be pure, clean, fervent love. It's like just the opposite of what he said in chapter 1. 1 Corinthians 14, 20, Paul says this. He's talking to Christians. How do you know? Because he mentions the first word, brethren. Whenever he says brethren, he's talking to believers that are saved, born again. Be not children in understanding. Uh, don't be simple when it comes to uh, knowledge and understanding, especially about the Bible. But how be it, he says, in malice, all those things we just said, those negative things, he said, in that, be like children. You know how kids are. 
they can fight over a toy, right? And punch each other and scream and yell, and two minutes later they're playing again. Well, that, again, it'd be nice if adults did that. Uh, but in understanding, be men, be not children, he says, but in malice, be children. And Ephesians 4.31, he says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Everything, like I said, that, that malice, that general sense of the word has a lot of other things under it. It's bad. It's wicked. It's the first thing he mentions here because it's a very hurtful it's very bad. It's a bad thing to have among believers, especially the ones that are to love our brothers and sisters again in Christ like they're even closer than our blood brothers. We're to be children of God. We're together in the family of God. In other words, when he says this, lay aside, number one, malice. You've got to think in your own heart. If you've ever had stuff, you say, well, maybe before I was saved, hopefully, right? Not now. This should never be named among believers. Second, as we move along, strip off, cast off, lay aside, guile, guile. <laughs> the word means to deceive. It's like setting a trap to catch someone, uh, to bait them. It means to be two-faced. <laughs> it's like you say one thing in front of the person, another thing behind their back. You're full of guile. Uh, when a person wants to get something, guile has to do with words what you say rather than the feelings like malice is just a strong hatred. Well, guile is you flatter someone, you give a false promise, an enticing word, but you're lying. <laughs> you, you don't mean what you're saying, in other words. Your words are not, not true. When a person wants something that has guile, he looks at the person's weakness and appeals to that to get his or her way. All right, it's deceiving. And again, taking advantage of others. And here again, it's very strong. We must lay aside not only malice, but also guile. We must not deceive and mislead people, all right? We must be honest in all our dealings, moving along. Third, strip off, lay aside hypocrisies, all right? The word, of course, means you pretend, you wear a mask, you put on a show. And I'm not talking about a Broadway show or a Christmas play. You're acting out in real life something that you're, you're not. The word means play acting, pretending. One who wears a mask to hide your real self. You act one way and you're really not that way. The true self doesn't show. You're hiding it, again, behind this mask of hypocrisy. It says here, if you'll note, malice, all guile, and... There's a little S there on the, on the end of the word. It says hypocrisies, plural. Well, there's all kinds of hypocrisies. A, a hypocrite can mean a person acts as though he loves the Lord, but doesn't live like what the Word of God tells him to do. In other words, he, he's a listener, he's a hearer, but he's not a doer of the Word. He says he is, but he's really not. He's acting when he pretends to follow God, but really is just doing what he wants it's my life. I'm not going to let God or anybody else tell me what to do. But yet, in front of other people, he says, oh, yeah, I want, to, I want God's will for my life. But he really doesn't. When a person shows concern for the things of God, but his real concern is for the things of the world, eventually these people are found out. When he acts as though he cares for people, but he's really selfish, self-seeking, possessive, hoarding, envious, and prideful. When he courts friends only to get something from them, but not, not really a friend. <laughs> when he acts friendly but could care less. When he promises but never keeps his promise. And I know some of you sitting here could say, you're counting me. I, I know a lot of people like that. <laughs> but this is for us. In other words, am I like that? Am I that way? I'm sure I've been that way in the past, and I'm, I'm hoping I'm not that way as a believer and as a pastor, but even as just a Christian, in other words, this is written to believers. Matthew 23, 28, Jesus said, even so ye also outwardly, he's talking to religious people now, the Pharisees. Remember, Jesus was tougher on the religious than he was on the lost sinners. He knew that they needed to be saved. These are people that appear on the outside. This is what the Pharisees, they look good. You see uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons going around. They look very sharp, clean-cut families coming around with their literature and their false information about the God's Word. And so he's saying, Jesus, they outwardly appear righteous, but within, full of hypocrisy. There it is. 
and iniquity, sin. And so we must be real. We can't be something that we're showing to people on one part of us and say, we're really not that way. And you know what? This is where a lot of times families have problems. We talk to young people and they were saying, how? What are you doing? You're ruining your family's reputation, your parents are embarrassed and this and that. And then you sit down with the young people and then they start saying, well, my parents will say that in church, but here's what they really are at home. And so hypocrisy will ruin your family life and your children. First Timothy 4, 1 and 2, Paul wrote, now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, you could say the last days, which we believe we're living in, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed and listening to seducing spirits, doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy. There it is, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. In other words, uh, having your conscience seared is kind of like having calluses on your hands. They, as you work hard with your hands, the skin gets thicker and thicker so you don't feel and you don't get blisters anymore. And it's the same thing. If you have a blistered or a hard heart, so that sin and things don't bother you anymore. That's what he's saying there. Speaking lies and hypocrisy. What does Peter say here to these beloved brethren and sisters? Lay it aside. And put it off. Malice. Guile. Hypocrisies. Fourth. There's two more. Envies. Believers must cast aside or lay aside envies. It means a person who covets what someone else has so much that he wants it, even if he has to steal it and take it away from the person. He may even wish that the other person did not have it, feeling like you deserve it, but they didn't deserve it. Uh, we may look at people and envy their money, their position in life, their looks. We don't do that. <laughs> we'll look at a, a thing on TV, watching these. I watch a lot of football, not really, just the Giants. Pray for me. And then I'll say, man, I remember when I used to play, <laughs> when, when my stomach was not bigger than my chest, <laughs> it was thinner than my chest. We say we're like pirates searching for a sunken chest, right? Uh, you're different. You're older. Your body's changing. <laughs> Part of aging uh, and aging uh, and enjoying it. I don't know about you. I don't enjoy it. But, but you look at someone, boy, I wish that and I wish this. That, that's envy. Possessions, money again, popularity, maybe a home or car, clothing, social status, recognition, authority. I mean, all these things that if you don't have it and you desire it, again, not, you're not going to work to get it in, in a normal, natural way it should. You're jealous or envious of the person that has these things. It's wrong. A person who envies is miserable, <laughs> have no peace. You're not happy, right? You're not the opposite of that would be contentment, right? But you're not content. You're dissatisfied. And you always want more. You know, some people, you can, can give them a million dollars and they'd probably waste it and still not be happy. They say, well, if I had this, I'd be happy. No, no, they wouldn't. They're never happy. Envy drives a person sometimes so much so that they, uh, again, the unsaved probably mostly, hopefully not a saved person, into crime, into stealing, and into lawlessness. It's to get what they crave for, that they want, that other people have. Uh, there's even been studies done that this kind of envy leads to physical problems eventually in your body. Migraines, headaches, high blood pressure, ulcers, and other things, emotional problems, going all the way to depression, suicide. I mean, it, it's, this is serious. And the warning here is, again, lay, lay it aside. Like the person in the hot air balloon going up and it starts to go down, they start throwing the weights off. Get rid of it. Have nothing to do with it. Proverbs 14.30 said, the sound heart, a sound heart, not your heart that pumps blood now, but your soul, who you really are, your mind and your soul, being sound is the life of the flesh, but envy is rottenness to the bones. I often think, I'm starting to get you know, back aches and soreness in places I never had before. Is that rottenness to the bones? Is that because of envy? I hope not. And if it is, I say, Lord, show me and help me to confess it and repent from it and change instantly if that's, if that's what it is. That Proverbs uh, usually hits things right on the head here. A sound heart, good. Life of the flesh. Envy? I, I really believe that. And they're finding out that more conditions and spiritual conditions affect your physical body. We know that. 
uh, science is finally catching up with the Bible, right? Proverbs 23, 17 says this, let not thine heart envy sinners. Now, I imagine you're envious. I used to say, people say, oh, well, our kids are complaining because these other kids get to do all these things, and you, mom and dad, you won't let us do this, you won't let us do that. I say, you think it's a lot of fun? You want to go out and get drunk with the rest of the kids and alcoholism and accidents and premature death and liver cirrhosis? You know, the devil doesn't show you what sin does to the body and what effects it has. So don't envy them. You're the one that they should be envying you because you're not into these dangerous, destructive habits. So let not your heart envy sinners. And it says, be in the fear of the Lord all the day long. Something you don't hear about too much either, fear of the Lord. Proverbs 24, 1, similar. Be not thou envious against evil men, neither desire to be with them. We could say women too in there, right? 1 Corinthians 13, 4, about charity or love, right? Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. True believers that are to have love, as we said here in chapter 1 of 1 Peter, should not have envy and be desirous of the things of others or be covetous or want or get to the point where you'll do anything to get the things of others. And fifth and last of these five things, strip off evil speakings. <laughs> Another could be big category. What's evil speaking, right? It's critical. It's judgmental, uh, backbiting, gossiping. Even the word that we hear a lot later to censor. <laughs> So that means that uh, Facebook, you put something on you don't like about the current administration, they're going to censor you. That's part of evil speaking, is to censor someone because uh, they don't believe we have freedom of speech, I guess, anymore. To grumble. It means to talk about and tear down another person, to spread lies about a person, to damage their reputation and image in the eyes of others. It means you talk about someone behind their back, of course, when they're not there. Not good. The scripture said it's evil speaking. It's evil speaking about someone. It's just as much as evil as the thing that you're saying about that person that you think is a failure in their life. That's more evil to talk about it and talk about it to others as if putting that person down with their failure isn't enough of them to be a failure. But now you're going to add on to the top of it by talking even worse about them. Believers are not to speak evil of one another. Again, believer to believer, ever, never. Now, if someone has sin in their life, we're not talking about that. That's a different story altogether. You go to the elders of the church and get it straightened out. But we're talking about just plain old, terribly done evil speaking. The reason here is why. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. You say, well, in real life, uh, my sisters and brothers don't get along. <laughs> They all hate each other. Not to be that way. Don't compare yourself to a, a dysfunctional family here, all right? In Christ, we're God's children, all right? We are to love, care, look after, edify, build up, not destroy each other. We're to be supportive, encouraging, and again, edifying, building up. This, think of this. When we criticize a brother or sister in Christ, now we're talking about believers, we're slandering one of God's children. Look at it that way. He or she is one of God's children. <laughs> You're talking bad about them. You're slandering a son or daughter of God. This alone should keep us from speaking evil. Ephesians 4.31, I quoted it already, right? <laughs> Terry? Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Similar to the wording here in 1 Peter where it says, lay aside, he says there, Put it away. Get it away from you. James 4.11 says this, Speak not evil of one another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judges his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. In other words, who made you a judge? <laughs> if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but now you're just a judge. And so the believer has to lay aside, put off, cast off these five things. And you could probably add other things, but he doesn't here. And so we just going through these five in verse 1. Right off the bat, after all the things of chapter 1 and how to treat and love with a fervent love, now he says, get rid of these things. Get rid of them. Second thing, my last point today is you are to crave something. It's, it's the word that we have. <laughs> and here he says, sincere desire. 
It's a craving. I, I have a lot of cravings, unfortunately, uh, being brought up in an Italian-American home. <laughs> As a kid, I'd go to stay with my grandmother for the weekend. I had two of them, both Italian and both good cooks. And so uh, I remember getting uh, in the morning, Sunday morning, I had to get up, go to church, and I'd start to smell. The house was, what is that smell? And it was frying meatballs uh, on Sunday morning to make the Sunday sauce with sausage and neck bones and pork and meatballs, and the meatballs had garlic in them. So that, you know the smell of frying garlic. Come on. They should make a cologne. Frying garlic or something. I don't know if anybody would really like it, but I like it. <laughs> I always tell the story of Pastor Blaylock in the church I uh, went to in Florida, a Beacon Baptist church. I would, like Terry sang today, every once in a while I'd get up and sing a special. And uh, Pastor Blaylock said one Sunday, you know, when the ladies come up and sing a special, and then I come up to preach after the lady's done, they just have left the pulpit. He said, I can still smell the perfume that they have on that day, you know. But when Brother Frank comes up here, it smells like garlic when, when he steps off the, the platform. And I said, amen. <laughs> Crave. Look at verse 2 and three, 3 here. As newborn babes, especially verse 2 here, desire. That's that word crave. It means in the original language, right? Desire the sincere milk of the word. We love the word of God. Amen. That why? That ye may grow thereby. And so three things here. All right. First, there's a charge. Again, it's an imperative. It's a command like it is to put off those five things. It's a command to desire and crave. It means yearn for the sincere milk of the word. A baby as is born, and the uh, first thing it does is scream <laughs> and cry. When Tina was born, we had a home birth. I delivered my, my son and my daughter in the home. And uh, Tina, for some reason, the, my, my wife was breastfeeding, wasn't happening. The first day, second day, third day, and we're like, hey, when's the milk coming in, you know? And everybody's getting worried that the baby's going to get sick and maybe die. You know, people get it. I said, it's fine. This is what happens. She just has to keep doing what she's doing. Eventually, you know, it'll come in. I think it was like the third or fourth day. Came in, and boy. <laughs> but until that day, my daughter Tina, who likes to sing as well, I said she developed her lungs when she was a baby because she screamed for three days. And I was like, man, to my wife, I, I send this kid back or something. I can't take I'm talking about without stop. She just had to have... She had to have that milk, and she really was craving it. And finally, after that, you didn't hear a peep. It was like when she fed, you'd take her arm and just, we used to call it liquid gold, liquid gold. The word desire means to crave, yearn, and long for, of course, talking about the Word of God. And this is a very strong word. It means you have to have it. Uh, you, have, you hunger for it. You're thirsting, as it says in the Old Testament, as the deer panted as the heart panted for the water in the spring it's like you're going to die if you don't get it that's how we should feel about the word of god if a believer again especially new believers but this is not just talking about a babe in christ what paul talks about in corinthians that they they can only give them the milk of the word because they're immature i was talking about all of us desiring as if we were still newborns physically desiring and going crazy after the milk we need to live too many believers will crave the word sporadically, especially when they first get saved. You know, there's that sort of growth spurt there. They're saved. It's new to them. They've never read the Bible before. It's like, you can't get enough of it. It's supposed to stay that way. It's supposed to stay that way, right? A constant yearning, desire, craving, and you're going to still grow. You know, Paul said he's finished his course before he died. He's kept the faith. But he talked about running in a race and, and not really attaining. He, he said, I'm, I'm running and I'm running and I'm and, and, and doing well. But he says, you never really sort of reach the finish line here in this life. In other words, we're never going to say, well, I got to the point in my life. I don't need any more Bible teaching. I mean, I, I'm not even coming to church anymore. I'm just going to stay home and have my own service on YouTube because I know so much. No, it's not gonna, that's pride. But you get to a point and we grow but even when we grow, we're mature Christians. We have many of them in here, ladies and men, that are they're growing and growing. And still, still, I know we have these studies, the ladies and men, when we have the first Sunday of the month, 
We're reading. We're still studying. You know, and people that are saved 20, 30, 40 years still have a desire. In fact, if you don't have that desire to get into the Bible, I, I wonder. I wonder if you're saved. This is something that should be normal. Normal for a believer to say, not to say this. I reached a point, I'm just, I'm sick of studying. No, I don't think something that you have to have and you desire and your relationship with God. Again, it'd be like me dating Terry and uh, after the first couple of months, yeah, I'm not going to be coming over every night anymore like I was when I first met you, Terry. I see you maybe once a month. Could you imagine? Well, we'd never be married right now. <laughs> Terry's saying, oh. <laughs> but I was there every night and she loved it. No. <laughs> Terry was going for her master's at the time when we were dating. And she said, don't think you're going to come here every night. You know, I got to study. I got papers. Plus, I'm teaching all day. I got a full-time job. And here I was pulling in that driveway every night. And so there's a desire. That's what it is. It's a strong craving and yearning, uh, again, in the Word of God. Do you have that? The word sincere, it means unadulterated, right? Uh, it means unmixed with anything else. <laughs> You know, people study about, and may study religions. We, we have a series on cults that we'll do here one day about false religions. I don't want to learn about false religion, but it, it helps to know why that they're wrong, you know, why we don't believe that way. Philosophies, education, psychology, science. I mean, there's a lot of things you could study, but they're not like the Word of God, all right? It's, of course, it's different. It's God's Word. It's, it's inspired. It's God speaking to us. But every other pursuit, although they may be good things to study, I love studying history and things about the country's history, about the history of the world, but they're all doomed, these other things, to pass away when a person dies off the scene. But one thing, and only one thing, all right, is perfectly pure. It's never going to uh, have to be admixed with anything else, and that is God's Word, the Word of God that lives and abides forever. In other words, the things we're learning about God's Word it's for all eternity, all right? unlike anything else we can study. And I'm not saying they're bad things. There's a lot of good things you can study, but this has to be the thing we crave and desire and we have to have. In other words, and we miss studying. I know if we'll miss uh, days of, of doing devotions or studying or prayer, and you, you say, boy, I, I really missed it. I'm missing that closeness with the Lord. Third, the word milk here, sincere milk, is the food needed. Now, not again, not just babes. In Christ, but of course we need the meat of the word, but we, we have to desire it again like a child desiring milk. A distinction here, uh, believers are seen again, not just immature babes in Christ, but all needing to grow, to learn more, to get closer to the Lord, to be able to understand more about salvation, to be able to share your faith. It's a constant growing process and we feed on this. A lot of churches aren't feeding on this anymore. I don't know if you know about that. You know, a lot of times we go to good churches all our lives. We don't even know what the other churches, are. and again, I'm not telling you to go and check it out, but their churches don't even study the Bible. They, they may come out with a verse of Scripture and then get on a topic that's totally different and talk about all kinds of philosophies and things, and they may be things that could be helpful to your marriage, to your brain, raising your children, but it's not the Word of God. Uh, all kinds of musicals, nothing wrong with music, but it's, it's, what happened to the Bible? The Bible is not center stage in a lot of churches. It's kind of off to the side. We, I, I know someone that didn't do like we do here, verse by verse study of the Bible, right? And they do what's more of a topical, and that sometimes that's needed. But they'll say, we're going to talk about this today, and somebody made fun of one pastor. He, he never did an exegesis who took out of each word, each verse to study, verse by verse, word for word. They said, this brother here, I won't mention names, he picks a topic and then he has to find a verse of Scripture to back it up. <laughs> it's not supposed to be that way. It's God's Word. And eventually, if you do study the whole counsel of God, 66 books, you're going to hit these topics within the Bible. And if you don't, you probably shouldn't preach on it. That was point one, the five things Point two now is why do we crave and yearn after the Word of God so that we can grow? And last, the result of craving the Word of God, which he says here again, desire sincerely, is you taste 
the grace of God. We sang, Terry, this morning about God and his love and the grace of God, the amazing grace. When you, as a babe, desire and partake and study and ingest <laughs> the word of God, you're going to see the grace of God. All right? It's going to be demonstrated for you. He reveals it as he feeds your soul with his word and teaches us about himself. We want to know more about God, you know. <laughs> we did studies on this uh, with uh, Blackaby. I hope I said his name right. <laughs> on experiencing God. You're not going to do it apart from his word. If somebody says, I had a dream last night, and I had a vision, all stuff. if it's apart from God's word, I, I, I wouldn't put much, much faith in that vision or dream. We get to know God by learning about him through his word. This book here, now there's many books, thousands and millions written about the Bible, but this is the Bible, the word of God. And we're not going to learn about God apart from that. God takes his word, of course, he feeds us, he nourishes us, he matures us, and we learn again about his grace. We become more and more like him as we read and obey his word. Acts chapter 20, Paul said this in verse 32. I love this chapter where he was meeting for the last time probably with the Ephesian elders there. It was a very emotional time. And he says in Acts 20, 32, Now, brethren, again, Christians, I commend you to God, turning you over to God, and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among them which are sanctified. You want to learn more about God? You want to be more Christ-like? You got to be in his word, in the word of his grace. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We always say if you can rightly divide God's word, you can do it wrong as well. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's inspired. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Psalm 119, can't wait to get to that chapter. Psalm 119.103 says, How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. That's right, God's word will be sweet to you if you read it absorb it, understand it, and most of all, be doers of it. The, the thing is not, we knew a guy in Florida, I, I tell you all the time, he called him the walking Bible. He memorized the Bible. It'd be nice to do that, but he wasn't saved. I mean, it's not sweet to someone. In fact, it's bitter to most people. They, Don't preach to me the Bible, you know, about my sin. No, if you're saved, you're living it, you're reading it, you're doers of the word, it's sweet, amen? First Peter 1 Peter 1.23 being born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible. By what? The Word of God. It's incorruptible, unlike anything else you'll ever read and get to know, which liveth and abideth forever. First Peter chapter 2 now, we're starting about putting off, laying aside malice, guile, hypocrisies, envies, evil speaking, and then as newborn babes, desire, crave the sincere milk of the Word. Do you have that? Are you craving it? You say, well, I really don't don't know about that. I'm not sure. Maybe you're not sure about your salvation. You might be here this morning. You don't know if you died right now that you would go to heaven. You can know that. You should know that because of a Bible reason. We can talk to you about that after the service. But then he says, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow. Christians aren't to stay uh, babes, right? They're to grow. And if they do, he says, if so be ye have tasted what? That the Lord is gracious and he is. Amen. So I, that's my prayer. That should be all of our collectively and individually to lay aside those things, terrible things, and to crave the Word of God. Amen. Let's pray. Let's ask God to help us in this area. Father, we thank you for this time. Lord, help us, please. We want to, of course, cast off, lay aside these five things mentioned here. And we could probably add to that list, but Peter mentions these things. And Lord, it covers a lot, a lot of areas. We looked at each word. Lord, I pray it would never be named, as Paul said, among us. Lord, help us, please, individually and collectively as a church to, Lord, be uh, holy. He said, be holy as I am holy. And if we were and we were uh, yearning for that holiness, we would not do these things. And, Lord, we instead have a strong craving or desire for your word. 
Lord, this church should be packed. We should have standing room only. People today desiring to hear, not from me, but from you, from your word. Lord, it tells everything we need to know about life and godliness found here in your word. Lord, help us, please. If there's anyone here this morning, Father, that has not yet trusted you, not born again, they've never been saved, they've never trusted Christ and what he did on the cross over 2,000 years ago, they haven't put their faith and trust in that, and they're not saved, Lord, and they... No wonder they don't have a desire for the Word. So help them to uh, publicly seek out someone this morning and, and, and talk about these things that we can show them from your Word what they need to do in order to be saved. Bless this time as we have a hymn of invitation, Lord. Again, speak to us individually and collectively as a church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>